Hello and welcome to Greater Somerville. I'm Joe Lynch. Although the election for Massachusetts governor takes place in 2018, the candidates are declaring their intention of running and now are hitting the radio and TV shows. My guest is Jay Gonzalez, a declared candidate for governor of Massachusetts. Jay is an attorney by profession, a former executive in the Governor Deval Patrick administration, a former health care provider executive, and now a candidate for the Democratic Party's selection for governor in 2018. A graduate of Dartmouth College and Georgetown Law School, Jay and his family make their home in Needham. It is my pleasure to welcome to Greater Somerville, candidate for governor of Massachusetts, Jay Gonzalez. Thank you for having me, Joe. Welcome back to Somerville. Thank you. We met yeah. at the caucus recently. Yes. Yeah, that there was a ton of people yeah. there. I was gonna say that was a was packed great. house. Yeah. Packed house. It's called, um, in, in uh, Somerville vernacular, it's called the Bernie effect. <laughs> Those were a lot of uh, Bernie Sanders supporters who have chosen to remain engaged. Yeah, well, you know, it's really neat. The, the room was packed. Uh, there was a ton of energy. And I was going around meeting a lot of people who were there, many of whom have never been to an event like that before. Right. And I'm experiencing that. I've been going all over the state in this campaign, meeting lots of different people at events like the one in Somerville and house events. And there is an energy and a lot of people, I think, as a result of this presidential election who want to get engaged and want to do something, which is really great. I love it, Jay, because it brings a whole new category of voter into the selection process. Yep. You know, as you know, you've, you've served in uh, Governor Patrick's administration. You've been around politics for a good many years. You know that politics is nothing more than a business. That, let me just, you don't have to comment on that. It is a business and it has its current customers and some of those customers leave, yep. either through passing on or unenrollment you need to keep your eye on where the new customers are coming from. And that's that current generation of 20 year old, 30 year old somethings who have never participated in the political uh, process before. I like it, I like it yeah. a lot. I'm not yeah. one of those old time Democrats who say, ah, that new group coming up, they don't know anything. I think they have more answers than we do. Yeah, well, I'm looking for as many supporters as I can get uh, and um, I started my campaign early. As you know, I was the first candidate to declare uh, for governor. And I did that because I want to spend as much time as possible getting around the state, meeting as many people as possible, uh, trying to build a real grassroots campaign. And like you said, it takes all types. Um, it always hopefully encourages some new people to get involved. But I think the starting point with this energy following the presidential election and people showing up who've never been to these types of events before, who are enrolling in the Democratic Party, wanting to get engaged in a campaign or some other outlet to, to help uh, move things forward and be civically active and engaged is really exciting. And we need to build on it and leverage it and uh, sustain it. So you're doing the circuit, Jay, and I know that you have a social media presence, but for those who are going to view this program, not only here on SCAT TV, but on our social media platforms, can you tell the viewers a little bit more about yourself? I always just give the... Yeah, so you mentioned I was a lawyer and, uh, and, and then worked in Governor Patrick's administration. I worked for Governor Patrick the first six years uh, and was eventually uh, his secretary of administration and finance, so I oversaw the state budget. Um, and uh, did that, had the unfortunate privilege of doing that during the Great Recession. Um, we had bad timing in that regard, but uh, it was a great experience and, and uh, loved working for Governor Patrick, who really uh, inspired me um, and, and I think was a great governor. Uh, and most recently, I was CEO of a health insurance company that covered low-income people in the Medicaid program here in Massachusetts and in New Hampshire. Um, and my whole life through that career um, was working with government in one way or another. And uh, I'm a big believer in the important role government plays in people's lives. And um, I've seen the difference it can make in people's lives. And I'm doing this and running for governor right now because I care about people and I wanna make a difference. And, and that's why I'm in this. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about um, how you foresee should you be successful, your governorship, and how you're going to make that difference for folks. Let's talk a little bit, Jay. I mean, you know, we gave a very, very brief outline before you came into the studio. What are the issues, the most pertinent issues that are facing Massachusetts today? 
I would sum it up, if it's okay, uh, because there are many, uh, with the fact that we need leadership. Um, one of the things I love about us as Americans, and particularly in Massachusetts, is we have always believed we can take on any challenge and overcome it. It is one of the things that makes us special in this country and that binds us. And we are facing a lot of challenges today that are holding people back, whether it's affordable uh, child care and preschool, which is an issue I, I uh, care passionately about and think is probably the thing we could do uh, that can make the biggest difference for kids and their parents that we're doing the least in right now, um, or affordable higher education, or health care, or trans our transportation system, you know, having a transportation system people can actually depend on to get to work on time. These are some of many issues that are holding people back, and we need leadership to take them on. And my concern right now is we're not only not making progress in these areas, we're not even trying. And I want to bring the type of leadership that is going to bring an ambitious agenda to take on a lot of these big challenges that are holding people back and move us forward, which is what we have always been about and what we've always strived to do. The other thing uh, I'm wanting to do and care deeply about uh, as governor and think is important for our governor to do is be a leader and just standing up for people. Um, you know, we, we've seen with President Trump uh, some real threats to our values. Uh, our immigrant community uh, in this state has been threatened in a lot of different ways. And it is one example among many where um, I think our current governor has not done a good enough job standing up for people. And I think people in this state need to know that our governor is there for them, that he is uh, opposed to hate and discrimination in any form and will stand up and fight to protect their rights and uh, in every way possible to make sure people feel included in this community. Let's go back to, let's go back. We're going to talk a little bit more, Jay, in the latter part of this program. We're going to talk a little bit more about the Trump administration's policies okay. and things that they're trying to enact yeah. and its trickle-down effect on Massachusetts. And then we can bring in Governor Baker into that conversation. Okay. But let's talk a little bit on higher education. Yeah. How do we help the, the folks who are going to be entering into higher education within the next few years and those that are coming out of a higher education institution just burdened with unspeakable yeah. debt just to get ahead. Yeah. I mean, you know and I know when you, when you were director of finance, there was something that was floated out there during the Patrick administration about um, free higher education. Yeah. Would that be something that y you would address head on running for governor? So I, I fully intend, I don't have it yet, I've, in the beginning stages of my campaign, but I fully intend to have a proposal around making higher education affordable for people in Massachusetts. Um, targeted to public higher education, our public university system and uh, community colleges. Um, but this is a huge problem. It is one of many examples of an area where a lot of people who have aspirations for higher education uh, and have the ability to get a degree and move on and be um, a productive uh, part of our economy, filling a lot of the, the jobs that uh, companies can't fill right now, where we're doing a disservice to them and they can't go to college because they can't afford it. Or, like you say, they're going and are so burdened with debt that they can't ever get ahead. Um, that's not okay, and it's not, not only not serving those people, those kids who, or, or beyond kids who are trying to get that uh, level of education, it's a disservice to us as a community and to our economic growth. Uh, and so um, it is uh, an area where right now we keep, you know, we're going the wrong direction. It's becoming more and more expensive every year. Um, and we have no plan for how we're, gonna, how we're gonna take on this challenge and make progress on it. I fully intend to have a proposal. I don't yet know what the details of it are gonna be. Uh, Governor Cuomo in New York just recently made tuition glad you free up, yep. at the state university how system. How are they funding it, do you know? Uh, I don't know exactly how they're funding it, um, but, but he has made uh, a commitment there to make tuition free in New York. Uh, for New York residents who make, I think it's under $125,000 a year. So um, I don't yet know what the proposal will look like, but the goal of it and what it will accomplish is to make higher education affordable for every uh, Massachusetts resident. Healthcare. Healthcare has been an issue 
Yeah. You name it. I mean, <laughs> yes. you, you've been in the industry. Healthcare is healthcare is healthcare. There's only one word that you can associate with it: expensive. Yeah. Whether it's the government subsidized system or it is private pay, it is expensive. Yeah. Um, we'll get a little bit more into the the Trump administration and what they're trying to do with the Affordable Care Act, but. One of the questions that was asked of me recently at a town hall was, and it was during the first attempt that President Trump was trying to get rid of the Affordable Care Act, if that is successful from a federal standpoint, that will certainly have in its effect on Massachusetts, Absolutely. even though some people yeah. think that we can always fall back to Romney care, yeah. the so-called Romney care. That's a fallacy, isn't it? It is a fallacy. Um, Romney Care was funded in part by the federal government. Right. It was a deal we made with the federal government where they agreed to fund half of the cost of our expanding coverage uh, when we did Massachusetts health reform. Uh, and what's happening, what the proposals at the federal level now in the Republican Congress and with President Trump are to pull back on uh, the, the Affordable Care Act and, and Obamacare in a way that could result in the state of Massachusetts losing one and a half to two billion dollars in federal support. And there goes Romney Care. And that would be a huge problem for us. So um, we have to fight at the federal level and we need a governor who's gonna be uh, fighting hard to preserve everything we can and hold the line. Unfortunately, we are in this situation with the administration we have in Washington and the Congress we have in Washington where the best we're going to do in many of these situations is hold the line. They are, they are trying to move backwards, and healthcare is one example. The only place we're going to move forward is here in Massachusetts, and we need leadership here in Massachusetts that is actually trying to move us forward. Healthcare is a great example. Even if we're successful at holding the line at the federal level, our system is broken the way it is today. Uh, we've got, we're proud to have universal coverage in Massachusetts, but that coverage is still way too expensive for many people. It is way too expensive for state government and crushing state government's ability to do many other things that it needs to do for businesses. It's way too complicated for people to navigate the healthcare system. It needs to be much simpler. And the quality is not great in a lot of areas. Mental, mental health uh, and behavioral health and, and covering uh, addiction is a great example of an area we're not doing nearly enough. I think we gotta take a big step back. Uh, we need leadership in this area. I think we need to put everything on the table for consideration, including single payer. Um, we keep putting Band-Aids on a system that has gaping wounds and it is not sustainable and it's not working for people. And um, this is an area where, again, we don't have leadership. We're not looking at how we build that system that's going to work for people and be sustainable over time, and we need to. Somebody can correct me. I mean, they usually do, Jay, when I misspeak on this show. But um, Governor ba we're going to talk about Governor Baker a little bit later. But Governor Baker has made some serious cuts yeah. um, to the health care system as we know it here in Massachusetts. And one of those bigger cuts comes to the in the area of mental health care. Um, here in Somerville, we have a small drop-in center known as the Ruby Rogers Center right here in Union Square. And because of the shuffling of the deck at the state level with the governor with Governor Baker's budget, they fear they will lose their funding completely. Yeah. I mean, what kind of assurances, not just for Ruby Rogers Center here in Somerville, but across the state, you've traveled across the state, what kind of assurances is the next governor, whether it's yourself or, or one of the contenders, what can we say to those small drop-in centers that from a mental health standpoint, they're going to be able to survive yeah. in the new overhaul of health care? Well, like I was just saying, with respect to the health care system overall, including mental health providers like the Ruby Rogers Centers and, and others, um, we have a long way to go toward where we need to be. And um, there's a lot of inefficiency and waste in our healthcare system. Um, we, need to, we, need to, we need to take a big step back and think about what we do to our system so that it is sustainable over time and giving people access to those services like what Ru the Ruby Rogers Center is providing to people. Um, we need to make it accessible to folks and affordable and uh, easy to navigate. Um, which right now it's not. So I think we need to reform our healthcare system and that needs to be part of it. But um, you know, looking at the cuts and the specifics of what's going on right now, the Ruby Rogers Center is not alone. There are opioid addiction 
uh, treatment programs that have been cut, and a number of other areas where Governor Baker has cut the budget. And, you know, we are in a period of economic growth right now. And Governor Baker's whole case for being governor was he was a good manager and he was going to fix the budget and, and other stuff. And yet he's really struggling to manage the budget. What kind of grade do you give the governor now? I, I, on, uh, I, on being a governor generally, I would give him a C. Um, I think uh, he's not even trying to move forward in areas where we need to move forward, and he's not doing a great job uh, managing. And this is the point I wanted to make. You know, we, we are in a period of economic growth, and he's continuing to struggle to manage the budget and cutting funding for programs that desperately need it, um, and scrambling at the end of the fiscal year again this year, just as he did last year, to, to balance the budget. Um, and he's put our bond ratings at risk. Uh, when I was there during the Great Recession, a much harder time. We had to make some tough choices. We successfully managed the budget. Uh, we continued to increase investment in public education and in infrastructure, and we achieved the highest bond ratings in state history. So I know about good management, and we can do a better job managing state government. But the big reason I give Governor Baker a low grade um, is not so much about that. It is the fact that managing government well is necessary, but it is not enough. We need a governor who's going to see the way the world should be and take us to that place, move us forward on areas that are holding us back. And uh, we don't have that kind of leadership right now, and that's the type of leadership I want to bring. One more question on the state side of things, Jay, on the infrastructure. Yeah. You know, we do, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, we see a lot, especially those of us in the eastern part of the state, we see a lot of construction projects, we see infrastructure projects. Yeah. But there's the whole other part of this state west of 128 or west of 495, yeah. that the bridges have fallen down, the roads are failing, the uh, public infrastructure is just abysmal. What is your administration or, or, or are you planning for that kind of investment in the infrastructure? More. That is what I'm planning. We've got to be honest about the fact that the state of our transportation system, and you're right to note that it's all over this state, but it's also here, the T. The T is not working for people. People can't depend on it. You read stories every day. And just as I'm going around the greater Boston area and Somerville and other places, the meeting I was at, I heard a lot of complaints about the T. And we need to be honest about the fact that it needs more investment. Um, we will not get to uh, a state of good repair or the system that people can count on with the T or roads and bridges across the state where we're one of the, the last in, in the country in terms of our ranking of our the condition of our transportation infrastructure. It's not okay. This is a fundamental responsibility of government, and we need more money to invest in it. That's why I am supporting a ballot question that's going to be on the ballot in 2018 that would impose an additional uh, income tax surcharge on incomes of over a million dollars a year. It'll affect like that many families in this state who've done well through this economic recovery and ask for a little bit more to invest in transportation and education. You're going to earmark um, those funds or are they go in the general fund? Already, this ballot question is, um, has already been developed. It's being pushed by a number of different groups. Um, and the, the ballot question itself earmarks the funds under the state constitution. So this would be um, uh, protected uh, under the constitution to transportation and education. And we desperately need it. It would generate $2 billion in new revenue a year about um, and that's meaningful, and that will make a big difference and allow us to move forward in getting the system to where it needs to be. Now, the question about um, public infrastructure and public transportation. As you know, the Green Line, um, Cambridge, Somerville, Medford, yeah, those I've three. Heard of that. That yeah. it, yeah, it's been <laughs> it's been mentioned, I think, once yeah. or twice here in Somerville. But um, John Dalton happened to appear on the show, and the commitment f from the federal government is we will get yeah. our billion dollars. Yeah. The state is committing their billion dollars for a $2.3 billion project. Yeah. Should you be successful, Somerville residents want to hear what your plan is for the Green Line. My plan is to finally make it happen. 2021. So, I, want, I want to tell you a funny story. When I, when I started in the Patrick administration, my first job was overseeing the state's capital budget at, in the Department of uh, Administration and Finance. And I found in the desk drawer of the desk that I inherited a settlement agreement that was signed by Governor Romney like six weeks before the end of his administration, swearing to God that he was going to finally do the Green Line project. And that agreement was with and the Conservation Law Foundation, that's right. probably. And, yeah. and um, 
the capital budget that we inherited from the Romney administration, which was hard to figure out, it was like on a one-page spreadsheet, had no money committed to this project. Mm -hmm. So one of the first things that um, I worked on with, with a bond bill and with the legislature and others was putting a hard commitment from in, in legislation to fund this project. And so, um, and we worked on that in the Patrick administration, obviously moved that forward. Um, and I'm personally, uh, I, think, I think it's a great project from a lot of different perspectives, and it's something we need to deliver on. Great. Let's take a, a short shift over to the Trump administration. Their actions have uh, been proven not to be very popular here in Massachusetts, in the blue state of Massachusetts. With every move that President Trump's administration is making, it has a trickle-down effect, whether it comes to immigration policy, yeah. sanctuary city, health care, um, the, the Defense Department spending. How, uh, Jay, explain to people, you know, how a Democratic governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts would have a better working relationship with the Trump administration than the Republican administration of Charlie Baker? Well, I, I don't know whether it would be better or not, but what I do know, um, having worked in government uh, in a leadership position, um, I know that as governor, you've got to work with lots of different stakeholders collaboratively. You need to work with the legislature collaboratively. You need to work with the federal government collaboratively with a lot of different stakeholders. Despite what our current president may think, there is no dictator who just decides everything in government. And that is a good thing. Uh, it's, what, it's the way our founders um, uh, structured our government, and it, re it requires talking to each other and working with other people. And if this is where we're trying to go, figuring out whatever that path is that's going to get, get, be able to successfully get as close as possible to that place. So we've got to work, and as governor, I would work collaboratively with the federal government, no matter who the president is or who the Congress is. Having said that, if they are taking actions that are a threat to our values or a threat to Massachusetts in whatever way, whether it's pulling back health care funding or environmental regulations or whatever, I won't be afraid to stand up to our president and, that's and to our Congress. And because there's some things that, uh, you know, as governor and representing the people of Massachusetts, but there are also some things that are so fundamental as a matter of principle that, it, that are just not okay. These immigration orders, one example. Um, and, and I would fight to protect as much as possible uh, what we need and not be afraid to stand up uh, if I thought that they were uh, taking actions that were against our interests. And that sounds to me, Jay, like, uh, you know, part of the reason why you've decided to run is that you feel as though Governor Baker is not doing that wholeheartedly. That is not what he's think, pushing forward I think on. that's a great way to describe it. There, there have been half-hearted um, uh, proclamations. And, and I will say, I, I don't believe Governor Baker is like Donald Trump or is like a lot of the extreme Republicans we have in other parts of the country. But um, I don't think I Charlie Baker think, thinks he's like them either. I, but so. I also think he has not stood up for our interests as strongly as he could or should as our governor. And, um, and I would, and, and I think uh, I, would, I would bring a, a different level of intensity um, to that and, uh, and stand up much more forcefully when I think we need to. Uh, before I forget it, Jay, website where people Thank can you see for asking. More, yes. more about Jay Gonzalez's run for governor. Our website is jayforma.com, J-A-Y number four M-A dot com. Great. So they can contact you there or through yes. any of the folks that are helping you with your campaign. Yep. One more quick question. We're probably running out of time here. What are you hearing outside of? I know you've been traveling a lot and I'm kind of following where you're going, but have you been out in the western part of the state? With, are the same issues that you're yeah. hearing out there that you hear here in the um, east? A lot of the same issues, um, and I have been all over the state, uh, including Western Mass. Um, but they are sometimes they're a little different. Uh, western Mass. One question I get every time I'm in Western Mass is, "Are you going to pay attention to Western Mass?" Uh, they often feel like they've gotten the shaft, and I think they're right um, that that folks in Boston and in state government aren't paying attention to their needs as much as they do in Boston, and, and I'm, I'm committed to being a governor of this entire state. I want to understand the unique issues that people are facing across this state or the common ones. Um, I'm learning a lot, which is, is great, and it's going to make me a better candidate and a better governor. Terrific. Jay Gonzalez, candidate for governor. Come back and see us. I will. Thank you, right. Joe. Great. Great to have you. All right.
My guest has been Jay Gonzalez, candidate for the Democratic, Democratic, hopefully the Democratic nominee for governor in 2018. I'm Joe Lynch. As always, stay safe, stay informed. We'll see you the next time.